This is a new time for designing, and a new time for designers. And there's a whole redefinition of what designers' responsibility is to their label that carries their name, as well as to the customers they're serving. You have a special insight into what your name on that label and your promise is all about. Since you are now not standing there with a pencil and drawing it, how do you do it? How do you control it? How do you ensure the fact that what you started out to do when you were one can now continue? Well, I think you used a very good word, if a very heavy word, promise. I do consider that the name on the label is um, a confidence or has become a confidence to my consumer. She now trusts the label, in other words. So that it is quite a job to ensure that that continues. And I think it's so fabulous, the relationship that we have with our consumer. She really writes letters, she comes up and speaks to me, etc. I'm trying to also communicate that confidence to the designers that I work with. Give me a portrait of your stable of designers. How, how many people you work with and how you interact with them. I think at the last count it was 16 for all the divisions. And I work, I still work more closely with the sportswear designers because that was how we started, that was the embryo, and that is still my first love. And then I work more on a weekly basis with the dress division, with the kids, with menswear, and with the licensees. And I don't even call the licensees really a designers. I keep forgetting that we have bought our accessory division, mm -hmm. therefore mm -hmm. I should count those designs, right. but right. I haven't included them. With sportswear, I'm really in on the inception, the ideas that they have, which they ask me to review with them and the product manager, who has already reviewed it. We discuss the ideas, the colors, the lack of color, which is something uh, you know that I feel very, very strongly about, and I want to make sure that there is color in all divisions. Color is critical to you. Critical. Why? I think it's such an easy tool to make you feel good. I smile when I see yellow or orange or a beautiful shade of blue. So you want clothes to sm have create a smile response yes. on the part of the consumer? Yes, oh, why not? I mean, we have to jump into clothes every morning and rush off. Why not have a little bit of a lift? Mm -hmm. I think color can do wonderful things for your mind as well as your looking well on you. I know that when I wear yellow, I look better. Uh, chartreuse, all those strange colors that people find difficult to wear. I love the way they look on me, and I love the way they look on a lot of people. Will this then translate as a basic attitude on your part in terms of the importance of color to design to the cosmetics you're going to be doing? Yes. We're, we're not there quite yet. We're not really into cosmetics yet, but I think that's going to be very important. that would be important. the translation? Absolutely. And I do believe that most women can wear a great many colors and change their lipstick color, eyeshadow color, or even their foundation or powder color a little bit to make it more becoming for them. But so color is terribly important to me. And even though I know that, uh, oh, a whole group of beiges and whites and whatnot could be terribly sophisticated and terribly beautiful, that can only, in my estimation, be a part of the line. Other parts of the line must have color in one way or another. But I work closely at that inception. The designers now do what they call tendency sketches just to 
give themselves as well as me a clearer picture of what they're talking about. They translate the ideas into just a very rough kind of a colored sketch of a mood of a group, or if it's going to be wild prints from the South Sea Islands, that's what this big sketch would translate, or it might be magazine clippings, anything to translate ideas visually. We're all designers are visual people. I'm a visual person. After that happens, then we really get much more refined as to what the actual fabrics will be, what the actual colors will be, what the actual prints or yandas or patterns will be. All that I oversee. When they're ready, I rush into the studio. Or if they're having a problem, they will call me in. Can we get your opinion on this? We're floundering a little bit, or we can't make up our minds. I'm used as a tool to help them and to edit and to pass, to okay. To the make the final decision. Yes. From there, we obviously go into actual garments. That's the last step, even though the ideas have been there all along. We want a long, loose, unconstructed jacket and baggy pants, or we're getting into a fitted little jacket with a full skirt or whatever. The ideas are already there because we also being such an organized company, in order to purchase the fabrics, we must get an idea of what the garments are going to be. I used to consider this very frustrating. Are you going to ask me now what I'm going to make out of this fabric? I don't know. Well, I had to discipline myself so no. and mm -hmm. sketch it out and think, oh, shit, it's much makeup on you. Um, you have to know, because the difference in yardage between a short skinny skirt and a long circle skirt is, you know, one is three times the other. So anyway, the designer already knows approximately what the pieces are, and we discuss what they should be. I mean, we should have a pleated skirt this year, that's what's going on, but we really feel that maybe short skinny skirts will finally come in. So we'll make one of those also. Looking at the garments and editing those out in actual samples is sort of the last stage. And then we make many changes. First of all, a couple of months have gone by now between the initial planning stages, the fabric planning, purchasing, original sketches, and now we have garments and maybe we've seen trends go on, or we've heard things that will make us change some of the initial concepts. Do you do some consumer testing of concepts? No. You don't? What we will do, Estelle, is on one line, have a couple of pieces or styles that are reach styles, as mm -hmm. we call them, that we know is not in the mainstream, but I encourage that because I want to test it. That's the consumer testing. Mm -hmm. It's very hard at times to get the stores to buy that from us. But I keep saying, you must have it on the line. You must not edit it out. I don't care whether you sell 500 pieces and our normal cutting tickets are in the thousands. But I want it out there simply to be tested. And you can certainly get some of our better stores to do it. So that's the way we test. Let me ask you about, from what I hear, the role that you play today as a designer, which uh, comes through very clear in what you're saying, has as a metaphor what a ballet master does in the choreography. You're choreographing a line. Oh, that's one of the way to it. Is, is that true? That <laughs> would, you, would, you, would you feel not that? Completely. Not completely? No, because I'm not doing the creative part. A choreographer, after all, really is very creative in what he sees or and the way it moves. that's important for me to hear. You're, you're not doing that. No, I am then not. What, then are you, are you a major editor? Yes. You're editing? Yes. All right, now you're, the thing that is and critical I'm to teaching. me. Oh, you're, all right. See, I'm teaching at the bottom end, 
uh, particularly when we get new people in. I also consider myself very knowledgeable after all these years in the construction of garments and how they should fit. Fit to me is terribly important. Right. Talk to that point. Talk First to of that. all, we are women. I consider being a woman a tremendous advantage. I get a little lost when I go up to menswear because I can't come from the same base. But being a woman, I know what my figure faults are. I know what looks well on me, how much better I feel when something fits me well. It has as much to do with how I feel as the color does. So I'm a bug about fit. And I help the designers there. And I will insist on being in on most of the production fittings. Because, first of all, I love it. It's really, uh, you know, Leonard and I used to do this together. He told and me. We really had he a told great me. time. He told me. He told me. This came Most through. people thought it was terrible work every night. Not at all. We would really get into it. I love it. I love it. And I think that that is something I can contribute. I can help the designers and tell them why. I think there's much too much fullness down here. I said, she looks like a pear. Do you want to look like a pear? No. I mean, after all, we're, we're fitting on girls who are pretty well built. And this is another thing that I insist on, that we do not fit on five, nine girls with broad shoulders and skinny hips. We fit no taller. My limit is five, seven and a half. I really prefer them five, seven. And I want them to have the full size eight measurements. Because you're kidding yourself the other way. We've just hired a new model. Most of the girls, the designers, don't like Because she's a little frumpy and she doesn't give back anything. Mm -hmm. She doesn't inspire you. I happen to think it's a good discipline. They have to work a little harder to make that garment look terrific. Mm. You know what? And that's the reality. That's our customer. That's the reality. She's an ideal compared to most of our customers. That's the reality. So that's another way of absolutely believing in reality. But I teach at the beginning, even uh, we have a staff in design. It is the textile design staff, because we do all our own colors all our own, prints all our own, yarn does. That's important to tell me. And, and you have that in that's too. That's a whole other design component in the company. And there is where sometimes I have a lot of problems. We have just been going through a print cycle. And prints, as everyone admits, are very personal. And I say, yes, they may be very personal, but they're just some things I can't swallow. And that's personal. That's <laughs> personal. <laughs> we didn't, I was in Hong Kong. I blame myself that I hadn't seen it before. But I opened it. I always take all the folders on the two lines that we're working on with me so that if we're discussing sweaters or yarns or whatever, I'm fully familiar again with the colors, the prints, and so forth. And I opened one folder and I said, what is this? And I got on the phone that night and I said, I can't believe that it's already in work. It may be engraved and we'll pay for the engraving, but that's not going on the line. Well, they didn't quite understand why. And when I came back, they said, you know, they had other prints ready for yeah. me and I picked one that was terrific. But it's very difficult to explain why you think something is ugly. But it's that personal decision factor. We talk, there's a wonderful restaurant called La Tulipe. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've ever been there. And I hope you'll let me take you and Art no. for dinner one night. There's a woman who is the chef who was a gourmet food writer. And she and her husband, he was a teacher. And they bought this house. And they set up this extraordinary restaurant in the village many, many years ago. She stays in the kitchen. You never see her. But what you yeah, know, have you heard it? It's, yes. the, it's quintessential authority cooking. But what you get is personal style in yes. food. You won't right. say it's Nouvelle Cuisine. You won't say it's international. You won't say anything except you know that woman's taste buds and her whole perception of how food should arrive at your table mm -hmm. is her. And that's what you're saying to me. We're talking about not just the personal style of the end-use consumer. We're talking about 
your personal style determining what comes through here. And yes. that's something that, you know, is critical in terms of your putting this mark on your product. And that's what gets lost, particularly when designers now become conglomerates. And, you, and, and the consumer right. now says, being very, you know, shall we say, iconoclastic about authority anyway, come on now, what did she do? What did she, ha what did she know about eyeglasses? You know, what does she know about chocolates, etc.? So once you trivialize your signature in the mind of the consumer, there's no way back. And that broad brush stroke has really damaged designer line authority. So for you now to admit that you don't even design it, but that you control the taste level, the design, the editing of it, and that in the final analysis is what you see for yourself and what you see for the consumer. And what important. I see for the consumer, yes, because I know my own personal style, but I also have learned enough about women. And if you're observant, uh, which we all should be, you know also the styles of other women. I know my style very well, but I also know that there are other women. Tell me the styles of women that you design for. What oh, kinds it's of very women? varied, and oh, that, tell me about that's it. something that I've been doing all my life, is really studying other women and how they look. Uh, there are certain things I won't do. You're absolutely right, because uh, I don't care. <laughs> Some women may love them, but I'm just not going to supply that. Form. But there are, I think also of color, colorations, I always think of blonde women as being a little bit more feminine, or they can be very all-American, but they still have a, a feminine kind of quality. Small, boned women wear clothes and look well in different things than stronger boned women. If you have a delicate face, you will look better in slightly more feminine clothes. You can do the contrary, too, and that's sometimes very exciting, putting a very feminine woman in very mannish clothes. But by and large, you do know that there are also different tastes. Uh, we laugh about the Southeastern woman because she is really quite different. And this is very general. It's a stereotypical it's thing, and it's changing. She but tends to wear slim back high heel pumps would never be caught dead in a pair of Oxfords, um, insists on having a soft hairdo. Soft is a term I hear continuously from women because they feel it would look better on them if it's soft looking. I don't Even though it's sportswear? Yes. Oh, yes. So how do they translate soft into sportswear? It can be color and it can be cut. Uh, I don't tend to make terribly tailored, hard-edged clothes, so that even if it's a shirt and cotton, it, it won't be so hard. There's normally a little softness through the cut, through the sleeve, through the collar. And the fit. And the fit, exactly. The comfort fit. The comfort fit. What I have found and what is very rewarding is that there are a lot of women out there who seem to be responding to this kind of thing. I do compromise, as you well know, Estelle, and sometimes in some of the divisions is not as much of my stamp as I would like it to be. Um, during this whole print explosion of the last year, it 1985 was a nightmare for me. It had to be a hard thing. Because the dress division was going into uh, Bamberg print. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and big, bold, dramatic prints. The girls wear division was doing what they call street prints. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't care whether it's in the street or not. Even menswear was doing prints that I didn't quite understand. Mm -hmm. And recently, since I, I did not go to Europe, but I did hear that there were practically no prints at Punya Vision. And I said, thank God for that. And I went around to all the divisions and I said, I'm on a campaign. There are no more bad taste prints coming out of this. Mm -hmm. 
That's how we get away with it. We call it street fashion. Bad taste. It appalls me. Liz, let's talk about menswear for a minute. You said you're sort of less comfortable, but something has happened to a new generation of men. Yes. Who are much more like the women you've been dressing. Why isn't it possible then for you to translate? And in addition to which, many of the women and their way they're dressing has now influenced men and how they're dressing. So tell me a little bit about why you wouldn't be comfortable in that sense making that translation. I just find it more difficult and I find that the retail atmosphere for menswear is more difficult and men themselves are more difficult. They're not as open-minded. You're absolutely right that there is a new generation. I think it's going to take another 10, 15 years before we really see a tremendous change in the way men shop, shop for themselves instead of having their wives shop for them, and shop with a little bit more of an open mind. Well, more are shopping for themselves because yes. their wives are working and they can't shop for them. That's You're, absolutely You've caught that. True. But they are still they tend still to be, the American male tends to be quite conservative. He still feels that being a peacock is not, it's dangerous. He will be looked upon askance. Homosexual? The best, yes, homosexual and even just being too vain, too involved in himself. The most, most businessmen can do. I was looking at one yesterday thinking, he is so much better. He is so perfect. His socks are so perfect. The cut of his suit is superb. But there it was almost black suit. I'm sure it was blue or charcoal. Uh, everything's so neat. Obviously, this man spends a lot of time on his clothes, but so conservative. It will take years before this is a young man, a relatively young man, but obviously only well, the way out. They were throw back to what they think is the peer pressure of the establishment power groups. So he's expressing his um, like of clothes through the meticulousness of the way he dresses. But the growth of sportswear for men has really begun to give you some hope, hasn't it? Oh, yes and I accessories, guess. the fact that they're wearing suspenders for no reason other than they, it suddenly it's gives them a sense of, under the most establishment suit, I've seen men wearing it's outlandish suspenders. And I said to one, what, tell me, it's in the menswear industry, why are you wearing suspenders, you know? I said, is it a comfort factor because you haven't got a belt? I wanted to understand, you know, haven't got a belt suppressing your waist? No, as a matter of fact, it isn't so comfortable. Then why are you wearing it? I don't know. I liked it, you see? <laughs> and it was, it was a statement. He was making a yeah. breakaway statement. Oh, I agree with you, Estelle, that it is happening. Obviously, it's happening. It's just that I'm still amazed at how conservative certain men are. Particularly Art in oh art, you will never see art in anything but well I understand what he's doing. But what this about is, the weekend? Oh, the weekend. Uh, give him a pair of sweatpants and All right. a nice big comfortable sweatshirt, and he's happy. Because the most conservative man is now breaking away for evening for sports and sportswear. Evening, evening dress is more irreverent. Really? Yes, particularly I mean, the young men who are standing on lines for the, you know, the, the, the movies and at the theater. I, was, I went to see uh, Precious Children the other night, Precious Sons, and there was a whole, you know, whole group of people. First of all, it's also, you know, which career? We have new breakaway careers for Oh, that. yes. It's not just the... Yeah. Um, Turn it. It's happening, there's no doubt about it that it's happening, but it's, um, it's going to take a while. Talk about kids. Kids, I have to understand more about kids because 
what's happening in kids, I gather, is, is really two things. Um, cheap business or a very expensive uh, boutique type of business. And then in the mainstream, there are ourselves and Esprit and very few other resources. And it all has to be fun and games. We are really styling down to the kids. This Not is styling is, up to the kids? This is what is so different in this country than in Europe. In Europe, it is still the parents who dictate what the kids will wear. And maybe it's changing, I'm sure it is. But there's still a, a great parental influence and they will spend time and money on their kids' clothes because they care how their kids look. Here it seems to be kind of a laissez-faire attitude that whatever uh, Susie wants... Early independence. Early independence. At least in that area, let them make the decision. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And as a result From of day, it... Day, daycare center dressing, you see it. <laughs> you see it at the daycare center. The kids are really dressing themselves. Absolutely. I can understand a child having great likes and dislikes and working within that. I mean, what's the point of uh, trying to go completely the opposite way? But I think it's a difficult business because of that. Uh, also, they're trying to emulate their bigger sisters, their teenage sisters, the ones who were really starting with the street fashion. That's what the little girls want to look like. Mm -hmm. So, and some of the street fashion is fun and great. And I, think I, fun and games, I think fun and games is wonderful. The whole description of that in terms of how you dress them. Because it is, it is for them, fun and games. That's what clothing yes. is. Yes, and they, of course, respond to color, which I have no objection to. It's just, uh, again, the prints. I wish we could go away from the prints. Or we have to decorate everything. And maybe that's a child's... Uh, mentality too who likes to decorate and finger paint and but I find that the kids artworks we went down to a um, daycare center yesterday for various reasons in Chinatown and I was of course as most preschool uh, daycare centers whatever the walls are covered with all the artwork of the kids in whatever media they were working in and I thought most of it was terrific and so far above what you're doing. What we're doing in the business, <laughs> I really felt like bringing. You should have brought you know, a designer. You should have brought down them. there and said, "Yes, kids love this kind of stuff, and they respond to it." But look at what they're doing. It's better than what we're doing. I think it's a marvelous idea. Are these the children uh, who are the workers? Yes, and this is down in connection. Chinatown. Marvelous connection. The kids themselves were adorable, of course, but uh, their work was good. Why didn't the annual report talk about bed linens? It left it because out completely. Because it's a licensee, and also, as you may or may not be aware, Burlington has sold its uh, bed linen division, which they I call something that. else, to J.P. Stevens. I didn't know that. It is in our contracts that we do not transfer licensees that they are not committed to. We will be talking to J.P. Stevens, but we have skipped a season. So at the moment, it is on hold. Let's say... It's been a tough business, too, Estelle. I can imagine. I can imagine. <laughs> let, me, let me move off of this and come quickly to the most important thing that relates this to why the program has not only your statements, and then on the back, we talk in terms of the curriculum at the college that reports design, management, marketing, production. So we bring the whole thing together. Tell me what you think, education for design, and the young person starting out must be today, must have today, must have access today to be the designer for today. I think that most of the design schools, not all of them, but most of them are too specific. They're too narrow. Um, some of them are excellent. Rhode Island is excellent. Parsons is excellent, though I disagree with a lot of what they teach. I think that as much art training as possible is good. 
because it teaches you to see. It teaches you to see color, proportion, just generally to be observant. Um, I think they spend perhaps too much time on the technical end, though I think you must learn that. Look at what you feel it, about it, production. Look at what you but feel. But you know something? I never went to sewing school. I learned everything on the job and sewing myself, having that kind of background. I did take some pattern making courses because I felt the lack in that. Really, what you learn is working as an assistant designer or as a... Um, so you're saying the apprentice system is critical? Critical. The internship. Critical. The internship and we even program. call them apprentice designers. Or interns, whatever. How many interns do you have on staff at any Each one time? Each designer always has one. Each designer has one. So, 16 is probably more because we have gals in the... Uh, textile design area whose specialty or whose training has been simply to match color and that's their first step. When you interview, what do you look for? You look for two things. Mainly you look for a certain amount of intelligence, enthusiasm, willingness to do anything because there is no job here that is too small or too big for anybody. If we ask you to sweep the floor, and that's what we want you to do. Being a team player. And of course, having a sense of creativity. How do you they feel that? I was going to say, how? always be that creative. Right, but how do you find, how do you determine is their portfolio telling it to you? Yes, your port their portfolio is definitely telling you what their taste level is. Uh, some of them can't draw that well, but you can see from what they're showing you what their thought processes are. So their thought process is critical in terms of design. But uh, sometimes when you see a stunning portfolio, you are tempted to hire the person because you know that he or she could be very creative. But we've hired a few of those, and um, sometimes they don't work out because they're too self-involved or want to move too quickly. And also, we don't want to spend six months training somebody and then having them leave. I don't expect them to stay forever, obviously. They have to move on. But uh, we do expect them to stay for a year and give back something that you have given them. And most of them who are good and get into it stay for a long time because they are also learning the business side. And they are learning that being a designer is a lot more than just what we have talked about. It's also being a merchant, making sure that we can afford it, as I put it. And that means that you don't put buttons that cost 20 cents a piece all the way down if you want this garment to retail for X. Uh, that embroidery, let's price it out before we go wild with ideas of, uh, you know, rhinestones all over everything. So that that kind of discipline, and the discipline of being on time, having these lines out, we work on three lines at a time continuously. We get our samples almost the night before. Everybody has to work here until midnight if that's what is required. They have to work over the weekend. Um, that's also part of the job. Is there a difference between designing and styling? Yes, I think there is. All right. But I think that most designers today are really stylish. I made a comment uh, recently when I was on the road and I was reading some of my articles that uh, Donna Karen, I think, is a real designer. She's a great good woman stylist. She knows how clothes should fit and works on them. Is that the difference? Is that no, the difference it's also it's really getting down and draping and designing it not mm -hmm. just on paper. Uh, many of us are stylists. I really think that I was always a stylist. I never really was innovative and just 
discovered new cuts and whatnot. I don't think Calvin does that either, but I think he has phenomenal taste in fabrics and how to put it together, and what is right at what time. That's a stylist. Do we need more stylists today because of the pace of fashion yes. change than we do designers? Also, I, mean, I don't think the women cotton. really want overly designed clothes. I think they really want fairly simple clothes. And we can move from a tailor jacket into a cardigan, and that she understands, and she will understand Donna's clothes because they're jersey and comfortable, and Donna has done them so well that they look fabulous on her. But I. Other than those small changes that go on, I don't think that we want terribly overly designed clothes. I mean, the French are more receptive to that. I think American women just can't be bothered that much. Uh, you have 42% growth. Uh, if I said to you, what do you think was the critical factor in that growth, cons con uh, considering the condition of the industry as a whole, considering the fact that your dominant distribution is department stores who have been trying to find themselves, uh, what would you say to us? We were part of it. <laughs> <laughs> it's really true, Estelle, I mean, from every point of view. Our sourcing is terribly important. We have maintained our prices and we're very hard at that. Uh, being more conscious than ever of learning what she's responding to, getting quite sophisticated with travelers and specialists and fashion consultants who travel to stores or are based in certain areas giving us feedback all the time. Good people. I mean, we have some terrific people. Most designer ads represent their super egos. You as a company have not invested in what I call super ego advertising. Why? We decided when we first started not to do that. First of all, I'm not a super ego person. I never was. I was never an upfront person. I had to be more as we went into business, and I learned to do it. But the I always refer to us as we. We are a team. So that how can you promote a team of egos? And we've all got our egos. It's different. We are a company. We are art often refers to the athletic teams. You tell me the metaphor. You tell me. You tell me about the basketball true. team. When I say we have a lot of good people here, I'm talking about Nolan Daniel, or Joe Moore, or Robert Mintz, who's now running Lizware. Not the designers, even. These are we try to get the best people to come How are you going to pass it on? With difficulty, <laughs> but no, I think with this team of these younger managers. Somebody but they need, will, but they need someone with a baton. Nobody they will need. replace art, but two heads will replace art. Two or three people will replace me. Doyle Dane Burnback, you remember that era. Yes. They broke the yes. path for advertising and communications the way you have for the fashion industry. They set a whole new standard for advertising, a criteria for excellence in design. They represented, as you did, a quartet the strong business person, the strong designing person, the strong account person, the strong copy person. The rest was history. As those people retired, Donald mm -hmm. Dane Burnbeck fell apart. Is there a way of passing this on, or do we have to believe we that companies have a lifespan? No, we think, and that's all it's ambition, is to perpetuate this company. What will you do to do that? We are spending, and this year is critical to us, teaching and hiring. Teaching and hiring? Hi, or I should say hiring and teaching, but trying to get some of the best people that we have worked with in various fields, whether they be retailers, and we've had an eye on them for a while. Why retailers? 
because we're so retail oriented, because they understand the distribution of goods and whether we continue to distribute in the same method that we are distributing now is not engraved in gold at all, or in steel, I should say. There may be different ways, and that's why we want the younger people aboard too. Because after all, also, if you just keep listening to the four ancient foreigners, um, we don't come up with the new, fresh ideas. You have to have that also, because they are already thinking. There are other ways to do They're this. They're into the 21st century. Exactly. We like retailers because they have this kind of head. <laughs> you, you don't mean that. You do. Some of them do. Some you do. Them. Well, why haven't they had it for themselves? Well, but I don't mean necessarily retailers from the large department stores. Right. One of our more recent uh, employees who was as bright as a whip is from the Limited and did all her own programs. So, so you're selected there, too. Well, well but it's not from retail, no, but it was from a, a, a gene company and spoke a language that he very shortly realized he can't speak here. But and smart and learned in six months what we were all about. But also had new ideas about how we could better what we're doing in that area. It's through these people that I think we're going to perpetuate the company mm -hmm. and we're moving them around. Ellen Daniel, whom I think you know, mm -hmm. and has been with the company for quite a while and I've known for a long, long time has just been promoted to vice president, senior vice president, excuse me, of corporate design. How old is she? She is, I don't know that I should say that. Yeah. <laughs> we, won't, we won't put it in. I didn't <laughs> realize how yeah. old she was until just the other day when we were talking about this new role. And she's going to be taking part of my role in working with mm -hmm. me now. Mm -hmm. I trust her taste level. I trust her commerciality, because she taught me how to be commercial. Really? Absolutely. What does that mean? Well, I always liked her, and she always liked me, but she would tell me, Liz, I'm not going to buy that. And I'd say, why not, Ellen? Because this color is just too difficult, or you have... Won't sell? Won't sell. That's commercial. That's commercial. <laughs> and, and I no longer make whole groups in olive green, <laughs> which I used to indulge myself in. I don't want to take any more of your time. You're wonderful. Okay. Thank you. This is probably going to be very exciting. <laughs>